The day is December 7th, 1941. A naval base off the coast of Honolulu, Hawaii, has been attacked by the Japanese Empire. Months of preparation and arguments between Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill will lead America to entering the European theater. 1944, 326,000 troops will invade Normandy on June 6th. Additional units that did not participate in the initial invasion are slowly delivered to the beach weeks after the invasion. One of the main reasons behind the massive retreat of the German forces was not just because of the brave men on the front line, but the swift response by the hard-working soldiers on the back line that continued to support the war effort. Could you just state your name and spell it just so we have it recorded? That way we don't misspell it. My yeah. name is Raymond Eklund, and I have to spell it because there's different ways of spelling it. It's E-K-L-U-N-D. Uh, while it was back in the Depression days, uh, I was born in 1924, so uh, I was about 10 years old during the Depression there. And it was kind of tough. Uh, fortunately, we were on the farm at the time, so we had a nice sized garden to give us supplies during the winter time. And uh, I went to a country grade school. It was eight grades in one little schoolhouse there. <laughs> and the last uh, eighth, eighth grade, I had a first time I ever had a man teacher, which was okay. Uh, uh, well, I was a month late getting into high school uh, because uh, my folks lost the farm or sold the farm uh, in September. Uh, I didn't know anything about basketballs at all until I went in there. <laughs> and so I remember carrying the ball around and they said, you know, you got to dribble it. <laughs> well, I played. Uh, play baseball. We, uh, when we lived in the country back in the 30s, uh, my brother took a team of farmer kids to uh, a town uh, and uh, I pitched the ball a game and we won one to nothing. We beat those big city folks. <laughs> so that was nice. My folks and my brother and I were visiting my sister about 20 miles away, but their radio wasn't working. So we didn't know about it until we got home about nine o'clock at night. And then we heard on our, my folks' radio that Pearl Harbor uh, was attacked. It was special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. I was drafted. I got an invitation from Uncle Sam. <laughs> yeah. I kind of expected it because I was already signed up, uh, not in the service, but the draft board had me pegged when I was in Seattle area. And so I kind of expected to be called, and I was. <clears throat> I was working in Seattle at the time at the uh, Kirkland shipyards. I was uh, working inside the ship, covering up with aluminum covers over degaussing cables that they had running all the way around the ship to, to try to, uh, I imagine, to keep the submarine bombs from hitting us, you know. So I worked there for about six months until I got my draft call and came home. Well, I was transferred into um, Chemical Warfare Division down by Birmingham, Alabama. 
and we learned how to put on masks and we learned about chemicals, different chemicals that the enemy might use. And uh, we went through basic training, about three months of it there. And then we uh, were transferred into the Transportation Corps in Louisiana, and we learned how to unload ships. And that was the work that I did from then on. Then on. <laughs> Uh, it was hot down there, it was up in the hundreds, and uh, it was very uncomfortable, but uh, they were very thorough with their training. Maybe because I was a farm kid, might have had something to do with it, you know. I uh, see things differently and do things differently and so on. We, we, uh, we learned how to work when we were kids. I was driving a team of horses on different equipment when I was about six years old, drove a tractor when I was about 10 years old. <laughs> so uh, I was getting used to doing various jobs that uh, the farming community required. Uh, we loaded on board ship January 1st, 1943. January 44 it would be, and we sailed on the 2nd of January. It took us about seven days to go over. Um, yeah, I was sick most of the time <laughs> with the ships, you know. And of course, um, I thought, well, if I go down to uh, the water level, it might be much better. But then I got so sick, I went upstairs to <laughs> heave overboard. <laughs> <laughs> so we made it. Well, that would be when we landed in uh, Great Britain. Uh, we didn't do anything. It, we did basic training. We, we, you know, military type of work and so on. Uh, uh, it was a different climate, but we we got used to it. I put on some weight over there. <laughs> Lost it when I came back. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did quite a bit of exercising and training, and I remember one time the company uh, was out there marching back and forth, giving us orders to right turn, left turn, reverse turn, and not to, to brag, but I was the last one that had to fall out. <laughs> In other words, everybody else had made a mistake and they had to drop out. So I felt good about that. Well, most of the uh, work was uh, in the Transportation Corps where we were unloading ships. Uh, I think the first time we started to unload ships is when we finally landed in France six weeks late and we were on the channel loading from the ship that was on the channel into these amphibious ducks, and they would haul the front stuff up to the uh, beachhead or wherever they had to take it, and then they would come back and get another load. Uh, that lasted about three months, and then we went into Cherbourg, France, where we were docked at a uh, seaport there. And the same thing when Antwerp, Belgium, we, uh, we unloaded ships right there in the dock. We landed at Omaha Beach. We spent about three months there, and then we went to Cherbourg, France, and spent about three months there. Then we traveled by train through Paris at night. So I could say I was in Paris, but I never saw it <laughs> because it was dark. And we ended up in Antwerp, Belgium, and that's where we spent the rest of the time there from I don't remember, probably uh, nine months before the war was over. There was a few German V-bombs came over, but I guess their accuracy, fortunately for us, was not too accurate, so they missed us by a couple of miles. I imagine they were headed for the ships, of course. Kind of scary. <laughs> it was scary. Well, we took it in stride, I guess. We were behind the lines 
unloading these ships to bring the cargo up front or wherever it was going to go? Well, you have... Um, <coughs> There are two winches on the, on the ship and uh, the cables come down to the bottom and they hook onto whatever you're gonna haul out of there. And so there's two people that have to operate these winches at a certain time. And so one would probably raise them up together, but then this one here would swing over so that the stuff would move over to the side of the boat. And then he would let his cable down so that uh, it would go down into wherever it's supposed to be going with her, into ducks, amphibious ducks or shipyards, shipyard docks. So there was always a two-man crew that was, was uh, lifting the stuff out of the ship and onto the dock. Well, there was ammunition, there was food, uh, trucks, I remember I was on the winch, as they call it, to lift the cargo out of the hole and over the side of the ship and drop it into whatever was there. And one time the cable broke and the truck stopped right on top of the boat between the hole and the outside, on the outside of the ship. And we repaired the cable and things went along okay. Well, let's see, uh, the ships we were on, I can only remember one hole, and we brought up trucks, we brought up food. Uh, I don't remember seeing any ammunition that we brought out of the hole, but it could have been. On March 11th, 1941, President Roosevelt signed the Lend-Lease Act which allowed the U.S. to send war supplies to their allies. On the day the bill was signed, Great Britain and Greece asked for aid and supplies removed immediately. The goods and services that the United States provided to our allies was at a rate of $1 billion a month, which in today's terms would be compared to $17.5 billion. Because of this astounding amount of supplies being transported, the Axis powers tried to prevent the Allies' transportation Germany used submarines with V-bombs equipped to target docks, and they did air bombings on supply lines and roads. This in mind, the Transportation Corp used amphibious ducks to help transport supplies and men to beaches until the port was safe and secure. Throughout the war, the Transportation Corp moved 7 million soldiers overseas and an astounding 100 and 26 million tons of cargo. The speed at which these supplies were transported were marveled by Japan and Germany. Within those same 24 hours, a squadron of tanks can roll off the assembly line and a flight of bombers can be made ready from radio to rudder boat. The United States was able to overwhelm the Axis powers by transporting supplies from factories within the U.S. mainland to the front line, courtesy of the Transportation Corps. Well, it was very important. It was, let's say, behind the front lines, but it was very important because we had to get the uh, ammunition and food and uh, all the other supplies up front so that they could use it. We, we kept busy all the time until the war ended, of course, and then things changed. Well, the war ended on uh, June 6th, and uh, we left La Havre, France, uh, about the 11th of December. We probably were on a passenger ship then. Actually, when we went over, it was a converted passenger ship that they uh, rearranged all the stuff in the ship to uh, bring a, a large number of people over. Arrived back in uh, New York on the 19th. And then uh, I went into Camp McCoy, Wisconsin, and got discharged and came home on Christmas Day. Of course, we had no way of communicating that I was coming home, so it was a big surprise to everybody when I got home. 
Oh, very welcoming to get home and be back in my little town of Robinson, which was about 100 people. <laughs> and, uh, and then I went to the University of North Dakota at Grand Forks. Well, it was kind of hard for me because I was uh, a poor reader. It was hard for me to study and consume the information that was there. But I graduated in 50, 1950. Uh, I, after I graduated from the University of North Dakota in 1950, I, uh, two, two friends of mine and I drove towards Chicago. For some reason, we didn't stop in Minneapolis-St. Paul to find a job. We headed for Chicago, and uh, one, one of the guys and myself stopped in Rockford, and I found work there. <clears throat> I worked at Barbara Coleman Company for eight years, and then I met my wife there. And then we had one child, and after that we uh, decided to move to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and find work there. Hello, my name is Misha, and I was the person editing your doc. Um, how are you doing, Eklund? I hope you're doing well. Thank you for sharing your story to not just me, but hopefully hundreds and hundreds of other people that will be wa that will be watching your documentary. Um, thank you for sharing your story once again. Uh, it was very it was very different from what I was actually expecting. When we first got you know the sheet of paper that was saying like different different veterans that we can all choose from, and when I ended up choosing your name, the only the only things that the paper said was that you're just a World War II vet that worked in the Transportation Corps. Now, obviously in schools, what we, what we usually learn from in times during like World War II is um, like the Normandy invasion or different, different battles that happen on the front lines, but what we never really learn about is what happens in the back lines. <laughs> When we have troops stationed all over the world, as we have today, our army is faced with a tremendous task of keeping them supplied. This is the responsibility of one of the newest branches of the army, the Transportation Corps. We don't le really learn about other positions in the war that are just as crucial as the soldiers fighting in the front lines. You know, I've never heard of the Transportation Corps. Obviously, there, there has to be some sort of way to get supplies and equipment to the front lines, but there was, no, there was nothing really about the Transportation Corps. There was no, there's, we didn't really learn about what you guys did and how, how you guys moved equipment. Thank you for sharing your story because it, when I joined this class, I wanted, to, I wanted to learn how to edit a documentary. I wanted to learn how to edit because I thought it was gonna be fun. But when I viewed your story, um, it taught me a little bit more than just how to edit a documentary. It taught me how to humble yourself and how to realize that even though if you're doing something, if even if it's not viewed as the highest responsibility or the or put in the spotlight, it doesn't mean it's less important. You know, I hope you enjoy your documentary and I hope you enjoy the work that I put in. Thank you for being brave enough to come down here to school and tell your story.